Well, good afternoon, guys. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right. So, did you do your homework? Yep. Did yep. you take a look at? Did you take a look at the Augsburg Confession? Yes. Yep. I didn't right. read it. You didn't have to read it. No, I just found I'm some wondering. of the information that you wanted us to find. All right. So, what did, you, what did you think while you were paging through the Augsburg Confession and getting some information? What did you think? Big. What? Big? It's really big. Well, the Augsburg Confession's not that big. The Book of Concord is really big, but the Augsburg Confession isn't nearly as big. Yeah, it's but it's kind of big. It's longer than the creeds. Well, yeah, it's a lot longer than the creeds, no doubt. Hadley? I thought the Augsburg Confession looked like a small chapter book. You thought it was like a chapter book? Okay. So, I had, I had three questions. What? What are pontiffs? Pontiffs? Pontiff is just a fancy name for Pope. Well, who is Gerson? Gerson was a, oh, I have to look him up, Jude. I'm not sure right off the bat. I'd have to, I don't remember. And who is the Imperial Majesty? The German translation keeps referring to. Yeah, the Imperial Majesty is Emperor Charles. And what is right. the blog? The what? The Decalogue. The Decalogue, you know that. You should, Decalogue, okay. I'll, Decalogue, you should have heard that before somewhere, but maybe not. Oliver? Oliver? Um, Deca means 10. Yeah. So it's like right. 10 logs? No, 10 log logs means is, book. 10 logs is a great guess. 10 books? That's a good guess, too. It actually comes from the Greek word, from the Latin for legus, which means law. So the Decalogue is the Ten Laws. It's the it's a fancy word for ten, ten, commandments. Ten, ten Commandments. That's right, Hadley. Um, I was just gonna guess ten books of the Bible. Okay, that's a pretty good guess. But the Decalogue is the Ten Commandments. Is what that is. And let me refresh my memory on Jerison because I should remember that, but I don't remember right offhand. So where did you read that? I read the whole Augsburg Confession. You didn't read the whole Augsburg Confession. Yeah, I did. He, he didn't read the Apology. You didn't read the Apology. So how many pages did you read of the Augsburg Confession? Uh, let me see. Um, well, I did the Greek translation. You mean the Latin? Yes, the Latin, I mean. I read all 28 um, articles. Okay, good for you, buddy. Um, I think so, yeah. The church's power is the longest one. Correct. All right, well, we'll talk more about it then. Let's get into it, Oliver. Um, so I was just rereading the introduction to the Augsburg Confession, and I found a few questions that I hadn't really realized the first time. Okay. But, um, what was, what did it mean by he wrote in, so in the Book of Concord, it said, uh, it says, therefore, we would also have to demonstrate their own orthodox, ortho, orthodoxy and Catholicity. Therefore, we can, therefore, he constructed a confession, changing its name from a, Apologia defense of 21 articles on doctrinal topics and seven articles on reform efforts. So what is that talking about? Well, that is talking about the Augsburg Confession that originally Melanchthon was going to call it an apology for the teaching. And he changed his mind and said he would just call it a confession. And then what later happened was they became the apology. Apology, we'll talk about later when we get to the apology. Apology means defense. And so it's a defense of a document. So if I write a document and make a statement about something, someone else comes along and says, that's not right. And they write a document attacking my document. Then I might write another document defending my first document. It's the apology. Exactly. It's the defense of my first document. So what Melanchthon was doing, what that says is, Melanchthon was trying to write a document showing that the teaching is what we're going to be talking about today. It's on your worksheet that the teaching of the Lutherans was Orthodox and Catholic. And we'll talk about both of those things in a little bit. Okay. 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 
Good. Now, so in your homework, how many articles were in the Augsburg Confession? 28. 28. And what language was the Augsburg Confession written in? German, Latin. Latin. Hadley. Latin. Latin and, and, German. and German, both. So all of the Book of Concord was written in either Latin or German. None of it was written in English. And so what you have is always a translation of the confession. All right, Hadley? Because um, the, for the two basic languages back then were Latin and German. So that's basically the only things that they would write it in. Correct. Well, that's the two biggest languages in Germany. But in other parts of the world, it would be like Latin and Italian, or it might be Latin and English if you were in England, or Latin and French, or Latin and Spanish. But Latin was pretty much everywhere. That's why people used it, because it was kind of like the academic language that everybody who was smart would use. Go ahead, Oliver. It was written in two different languages. For the Latin was for King Charles to read. Um, well, um, Someone else read the German translation to the common people. All right, exactly right. And so the reason it was written in German and put in German was so that more people who were not so maybe educated or academics were also able to have access to it. So then like workers and farmers and teachers and things like that, they could also read it because they would know German, but they might not know Latin. So that way they could have access to what was being said. All right, very good. Go ahead, Oliver. Um, just one more question. What was the assembly of 404 propositions? Yeah, we'll talk about that today a little bit, okay? We'll get into that too, okay? Good questions. You're reading stuff and, and learning. So Jude, you read the whole thing. What did you think about it when you read the whole thing? Very confusing. Very confusing, okay. And we'll talk, that's why we're having this class. Now, I'm not saying that after this class, you'll have an answer to everything you read in the Augsburg and Fashion, because there's a lot of stuff in there, but you'll have a better understanding, I think, okay? So let's work our way through some more of lesson three, uh, your worksheet number three. The people who actually confessed at Augsburg were, so who was actually officially confessing their faith? They were the princes, all right? So they were the princes who were doing that. So you can fill that blank in if you want to. That would be princes is the right answer. So it wasn't theologians, were, this is lesson number three, okay, and that blank right there. Oh, we already did that, yeah. Okay, good. We've, we've got the Augsburg Confession tried to do th three things, one through three. Okay. That's what okay. That's All far right. as we saw. Okay, very good. So the Augsburg Confession tried to do these three things. So we talked about the radical reformers last week, okay? And how they were trying to take some of the ideas and just pushing them too far and how Luther was not happy about that. Lincoln wasn't happy about that. And what did I say they were all called? Um, radical. Radical, okay? Now, the real difference between the radical reformers and the other reformers was kind of exemplified by their attitude toward the government. And that's really how people distinguish between the two. The other reformers like Luther and Calvin were called magisterial reformers. Did I tell you that last week? Uh, maybe. Okay. Oh, you I told didn't... us they were called Protestants. All right. They were all called Protestants. Even the radical guys were called Protestants. They were all kind of lumped together as Protestants. And so nowadays, you're either a Catholic or you're a Protestant if you're a Christian in the West. And so that's kind of the two choices, Catholic or Protestant. So Protestant means everybody who's not Catholic. But the reformers would make a distinction between themselves because there were those who were reformers who thought that it was right to be obedient to the government. They were called the magisterial reformers. That would be Luther and Calvin, who thought they should work with the princes and be obedient. The radical reformers weren't really interested in working with the governments at all. They were ready to just kind of do their own thing and even rebel against governments if they needed to. They didn't care that much. Okay. All right. Hadley. So are we, which one are we, the ones who rebel against the government or the ones who just listen to the government? We're part of the magisterial re reformation. So we would say the government should be obeyed. And that's what we teach. You obey the government unless the government tells you to do something opposed to God's will. Otherwise, you will pay the government. Okay, Jude? Nothing. Okay, so 
The Augsburg Confession tried to do three things, three things that Melanchthon wanted it to do. The first thing he wanted to do was he wanted to show that Lutherans aren't radical. Okay, that was the very first important thing, that Lutherans aren't radical, that they wanted to be obeying the government. They weren't trying to overthrow the government. They weren't interested in fighting against the emperor. Zwingli, he was ready to fight the emperor. And Munzer, he had no interest in following human rules. In fact, he started making a bunch of new rules like you don't need to get married anymore and you don't need to obey governments and we don't need to have, you know, we don't need to worry about any kind of rules here because Jesus is coming back soon, so who cares how we live? That was the kind of stuff they were teaching. And so the Lutherans said, that's wrong. They wanted to make sure everybody understood that the Lutherans were not radical Reformation people because right before the Lutherans got to Augsburg for the Diet of Augsburg, some of the Catholic opponents had released a document and spread it all over Augsburg. They printed a whole bunch of copies called the 404 Propositions. And it was supposedly a list of all the things that Lutherans taught. But what he did, what the Catholics did was they mixed up radical ideas and Lutheran ideas and put them all together like they were all Lutheran ideas. So things that the radicals were teaching, which Lutherans did not believe, were being accused, the Lutherans were being accused of that. And so Melanchthon wanted to straighten out, no, we teach these things, but not these things. So the first thing the Augsburg Confession was trying to do was to make a distinction between the Lutherans and the Radical Reformation. Okay, does that make sense? Yes. Go ahead, Oliver. So that's the apology of the um, Augsburg Confession that came in to be in defense of the four, 404 propositions. Uh, in defense of the Augsburg Confession, which was taken a bit too far by the 404 propositions? Well, the 404 was first, then came the Augsburg Confession, and, L and Melanchthon changed his plan in light of that. That's why he kind of changed how he was going to go about doing it, because that was around. So he decided just to make a clear, nice Lutheran Confession. And then, after the Roman Catholics rejected the Augsburg Confession later this summer, of 1530, then Melanchthon got busy and started writing what would be called the Apology, which is a very long document. It's one of the longest documents in the whole Book of Concord, and we'll talk about that later, okay? Okay. Okay. All right. We're going to spend the most time in this class on the Augsburg Confession. In fact, we might spend most of the year on the Augsburg Confession, because that's where the heart of our doctrine really is. And if you want to get a good idea of Lutheran doctrine, you should look at the Augsburg Confession. Okay, Hadley? Are you going to go through each of the 28 articles? I'm going to look at every one of them with you, yes. Really? Yes, really. That's why it's going to take a while, okay? All right. Now, I'm not saying we're going to read all of it out loud together because we're not, but we're going to look at all. We'll take a look at every one of the 28, okay? Sometimes briefly, but we'll look at all of them. All right, good. So let's move on. So the second reason that... The Augsburg Confession was written. The second thing Melanchthon was trying to do was he wanted to show that the Lutherans are the true church. That the Lutherans are the true church. And that's what it means, Oliver, in your question you were asking, which is a good question. That's what it means when, Luther, when Melanchthon says we are Orthodox and Catholic. So the word Orthodox, what does that mean? You guys know? Go ahead, Titus. Together, maybe? Together is not a bad guess. Orthodox is a word we use, but it comes from Greek, like a lot of our words do in theology. Go ahead, Jude. No. All right. Ortho in Greek means straight. That's why if you go to an orthodontist someday, his job is to make your teeth straight. Okay. All right. So an orthodontist is trying to straighten out your teeth. All right. Oliver. Orthodox means they have a straight path to Jesus. A straight path. That's a very good guess. And that's kind of what it ends up being. Go ahead, Hadley. Straight doctrine, like the right doctrine. Straight doctrine is also a very good guess. The word doxis actually means praise or glory. And so orthodox meant right worship, which also then if you have the right worship of God, you have the right teaching about God. So orthodox means for us correct teaching about God, straight 
praise, straight teaching, the right teaching. So the word orthodox means the right way to teach and talk about God. Now, let me ask, say a few more things and I'll answer your questions, guys. So orthodox, when we use it, you should use like a, a little lowercase o. Because nowadays, there are Christians who live in the eastern part of the world, like in Russia and Ukraine and Greece even, and Asia Minor and parts of Africa, who are what we'd say in the east rather than the west. Well, a long time ago, in the 12th century, in the 1100s, there was a fight among the Christians over a few things like, how much power does the Roman Pope really have? Is he the most important? And then there was a discussion about when should we celebrate Easter and when should we celebrate Christmas and a few other discussions they were having. Well, they had tried to start it out, but eventually they couldn't decide. And the East got angry and the West got angry and the Pope excommunicated a bunch of archbishops and archbishops excommunicated the Pope. And that's been called the Great Schism. So the Great Schism, the S-C-H-I-S-M, that happened in the 12th century, and that split apart the church into East and West, and we've had that ever since. So let me finish my story, Titus. So the Great Schism happened in the 12th century, 1128, early, early on, and it divided the church between the West, which is basically then Roman Catholic, and the East, which was Orthodox, and that's what they call themselves. And so they all call themselves Eastern Orthodox, capital E, capital O, or they might call themselves Russian Orthodox or Ukrainian Orthodox or whatever Orthodox they might want to be to designate who we're talking about. Okay. So the Orthodox churches to this day are still around. When we, when Mavi and Papa were recently in Latvia, we saw Orthodox churches. There's a lot of them in Latvia. And so you can see an Orthodox church, and there are Orthodox churches around here. There's one right by Francis Park, an Orthodox church. And you've seen them, if you drive around, if you watch them, you'll see them. They're Orthodox churches. So in America, Orthodox is almost like a denomination. It's for the people who came over from those places, and they can keep on going to church places they like. And they'll worship in Greek sometimes even, or other languages, or in English. But they use a special kind of liturgy that the Orthodox use. Okay? So the word Orthodox just means right teaching. But if it's capital O Orthodox, it means the Eastern way of trying to be a Christian. Okay, now your questions, Oliver. Um, so is it a, like a big religion or is it just a way of thinking stuff? No, it's like a big religion. It's almost, for us in America, we would say it's like a denomination. It's another way of being a Christian. Now the Orthodox themselves, if you would talk to a Greek Orthodox priest or a Russian Orthodox priest, he would say, no, we're the true church. The West is in rebellion and they've got mistakes. One of the big discussions was whether or not the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father alone or from the Father and the Son. Now, you know, in the Nicene Creed, what do we say on Sunday? Who proceeds from the Father and, and the Son. Son. And that's what we say. But the Eastern Orthodox say, no, the Holy Spirit only proceeds from the Father. And that was part of the big discussion and part of the big fight. Uh, and, it's, and in Latin, it's called the filioque, because in Latin, it's and the Son. But that was the big discussion. We don't think that is really what the issue was. What was really probably causing the divide and the Great Schism was over power, who's really in charge. And the East was tired of the Rome, Roman power. Roman bishop acting like he was the most important. They didn't like that much anymore. And the Roman bishop got tired of them not listening to his authority because he thought he was in charge. And so that was really what it was a fight about. People, you'll learn, like to fight a lot about who's in charge. Go ahead, Titus. Um, is that when the each pope in turn came during worship service and excommunicated the other pope? Well, those kinds of things happened other times, too. There were times later on in Western history where there were more than one pope going at a time. And so things got a little confusing during the Middle Ages. Yeah, so you would have maybe two popes, both complaining, claiming to be pope. And there was a time when there was even three popes. So things got pretty messy sometimes. And see, what's the issue that's the same every time? Who's in charge here? Who really has the power? And like I said, people like to be in charge. And you guys know that even kids are that way, aren't they? People like to be in charge of who's going to decide what we're going to do, who's going to be in charge of what we're going to do this afternoon, who's going to decide how this game is going to work. 
people like to be in charge, don't they? And so yeah. adults are no different. They like to be in charge. They like to make the rules. They like to call the shots. And so this is always a problem with human beings that our sin may just want to be in charge and then we create problems. All right, Hadley. Not many people during the Middle Ages had real humility. Not many people have humility. You're right. I agree. And that's why Jesus calls us to practice humility because our natural human nature tends not to do that. But that's Article 2 of the Augsburg Confession. We're not there yet. All right, Oliver. Um, so, oh, so if they have more than one Pope, it gets like, some people like to follow this Pope, some people like to follow this one. So it rips, so it takes them apart, rips the church apart. That's right. And it causes divisions. And that's why we call it the great schism, because there's a division in the church between the East and West. And does God like it when there's divisions in the church? No. Nope. No, it's not a good thing. So we should be sad about divisions in the church. And yet sometimes divisions have to happen because somebody's teaching something that's false and they won't listen to the truth. This is what Luther had to deal with. And you have to, and a division happens in the church, but it's a sad thing, something we shouldn't get all excited about. All right, good. A uh, doxa means glory. That's exactly right. So straight glory or straight praise. That's right. So that's orthodox. Now, what does Catholic mean? Catholic is another word that comes from Greek. And Catholic means kataholos, which means according to the whole. So Catholic means the whole thing, all of it. So when we say the Catholic church, what we mean is the whole entire church. So if the Lutherans were trying to say our teaching is orthodox and it is Catholic, what were they trying to say? That, that it's the straight way for everyone. All right, Jude? Um, kata is the pre preposition meaning according to. Correct. And so straight praise and teach according to everyone. So not only is it the right teaching and everyone should believe it, but it's what everyone in the church does believe. That's the claim that the Lutherans are making. Everybody who's a true Christian is going to believe what we believe. So what we say about the Augsburg Confession is it's not just a Lutheran idea, but it's God's truth idea. And every true follower of Jesus should be able to read the Augsburg Confession and say, excuse me, and say, yeah, that's right. That's right, because it's God's truth. And that's what the Augsburg Confession is trying to do. Third thing Melanchthon is trying to do. Third thing. Go ahead, Hadley. What? I was just going to say that when I read the introduction to the Augsburg and glanced at the Augsburg, it didn't seem more like it didn't seem more like a Bible class. It seemed more like history. Yes, it's a lot like history because these are things happening in real time with real people and the historical events matter a lot. Things like the 404 propositions and act and other people, you know, and Melanchthon and the emperor, all that stuff. But through it all, God's truth is being taught. And because God's truth is being taught, that's why we keep on reading it today. It's not just history. So the third thing Melanchthon is trying to do is he's trying to give an outline of the Christian faith. He's trying to give an outline of the Christian faith. So what he does in describing the teaching of the Lutherans is he gives a clear picture of what Christians believe. It has a definite kind of flow, and we'll talk about that more when we get to lesson four here in just a minute. But that's what he's doing, those three things. He's showing that Lutherans are not radical. He's showing that Lutherans are teaching Orthodox and Catholic teaching, that we are teaching the true faith. And he's giving an outline of the whole faith. There's a nice phrase for this. These are all teaching, and this is the last two blanks on your page, the regula fide. This is a Latin phrase. Regula is R-E-G-U-L-A. Okay, and second word is fide, which is F-I-D-E-I. -E -I. The regular fide. And the regular fide means rule of faith. The rule of faith. So the regular fide is the teachings of the Christian faith. 
It's the rule, it's the outline, it's the guide, it's the direction for the Christian faith. So what the Augsburg Confession is doing is it's providing an outline or a clear summary of the regula fide. This is what Christians believe is the rule of faith. Okay? Any other questions on number three? Nope. Great. Let's get started on number four then. Okay? So in Latin... The Augsburg Confession, that's what AC stands for. You probably figured that out, right? No, <laughs> I didn't. Uh, in Latin, the AC, AC stands for Augsburg Confession. In Latin, the AC is called the Confessio Augustana. So it's C-O-N-F-E-S-S-I-O, -S -S and then Augustana, A U G U S T. A N A. And sometimes you'll see that written down the Confessio Augustana. And all that means is Augsburg Confession, but it's in Latin. And Latin sounds more impressive and kind of smarter. And so, so, so you can say, Oh, I've been reading the Confessio Augustana. And people will go, Whoa, what have you been reading? Well, it's the Augsburg Confession, but it's the Confessio Augustana. And it sounds very impressive. And so sometimes you will see abbreviations for the Augsburg Confession as AC. Sometimes you'll see them as CA, but they mean the same thing. So it's either Confessio Augustana or Augsburg Confession. It means the same thing. So if I were to write down, I want you to read AC, comma, Roman numeral four, comma, two. What would that mean? Well, you get your book of Concord out, and you would find the Augsburg Confession, Hadley. Um, the Aug the Augsburg Confession, Chapter Four. Well, it's not called Chapter Four; it's called Article, Article Four. All right, and then the last number I gave you there was a two. Remember, I told you it would. If I had had you look up AC four two, Oliver. Second se second part of that second the sentence second part we call it paragraph and that way you would find that on page 40 and 41 of Cole Winger, right you see it there how is what's the first thing you read there it says when we believe Christ's sake through faith when we believe that Christ has suffered for us see that on page 40 yes. that's paragraph two of Augsburg confession four understand how that works yep so Augsburg Confession is the name of the confession or document. Four is the number of the article. And what's the name of the article according to your Cole Wingard on page, the previous page for article four? What's it called? Um, concerning the new obedience. Well, that's article six. Make sure you're at article four. Oh, sorry. Concerning justification. Yeah. Concerning justification. That's article four. And remember, on the left side of the page is the German, and the left side of the page is called the verso of a book. Did you know that? All the left hand pages of a book are called the verso pages, V E R S O, and the right hand pages are called the recto pages, R E C T O. So the left hand or verso pages are German. And the right hand or recto pages are the Latin. Okay. And so if I were going to tell you, I want you to look up AC 16 3. Tell me what it says. Find AC 16 3. AC, comma, 16 in Roman numerals, comma, 3. So what's the Roman numeral for 16? XVI. XVI, good. <coughs> Did you find that? Yep. Okay, and what does paragraph three say? They condemn the Anabaptists who prohibit Christians from assuming such civil responsibilities. Perfect. You found it. You see how that works? That's called a reference in the Book of Concord. So that's how you find the Augsburg Confession references. Okay, so it works that way all the time. And so you could just say AC 16, 3, and you know exactly where to look. It's kind of like chapters and verses in the Bible. Now, the little teeny numbers that I'm even calling paragraphs, sometimes they correspond to the paragraphs in English. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they happen right in the middle of a sentence almost. And that's because the little numbers were put in in the original language. 
and the original language was more broken up in German or Latin, but when it gets translated into English, it's not always neatly corresponding, okay? All right, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, good. So, it was written by who? Who wrote the Book of Concord? We've been talking about him a lot, so who wrote it? Philip Melanchthon. No! That's the Book of Concord. No. The Augsburg Confession was written by Philip Melanchthon. This is the right. Book of Concord. The whole Book of Concord was written by lots of people. The whole Book of Concord includes the creeds. We're not sure who wrote those. The Augsburg Confession. The Apology of the Augsburg Confession. Then we have the small and large catechisms. We have the small called articles. We have the treatise and the power and primacy of the Pope. Then we have the formula of Concord. And so Melanchthon wrote some of it. Luther wrote some of it. And then a whole bunch of guys wrote the last part called the formula. Okay? So Melanchthon wrote the Augsburg Confession. And you spell Melanchthon, M-E-L-A-N-C-H. T-H-O-N. Go ahead, Oliver. Um, it was, we were supposed to written by, we were supposed to write, it was written by, or we were supposed to write Melanchthon, uh, Melanchthon there? Yep. Okay, I just thought that was talking about the whole book of Concord. No, this is talking okay. about the Augsburg Confession, okay? The Confessio Augustana was written by Philip Melanchthon. So everybody's got it in there now. M E L A N C H T H O N. Melanchthon. Now, what's interesting is when Melanchthon was born, his last name wasn't Melanchthon. When he was born, his last name was Schwarzerde, which means black dirt. All right. And black dirt? Yeah, in German, Schwarz means black and Erde means earth or dirt. Black earth. So maybe he was because he lived in a farm and had really good black dirt somewhere along the way. And so his daddy or his great great grandfather was called Schwartz Erda. And so then they started calling his kids your Schwartz Erda, your Melanchthon Schwartz Erda. Well, Melanchthon was learning, going to school, and he was a young man when Greek was becoming very cool and Latin was very cool. And so somebody said, you know what you should do? You should change your very German kind of sounding name, Black Dirt, and why don't you change it to Melanchthon? And what Melanchthon means is Black Dirt, only in Greek. Oh! So, so that's what he did. So Melanchthon is just the Greek way of saying Schwarzerde, Black Dirt, or Black Earth. Okay, Hadley? Well, he technically didn't even change his name. Correct, even though it looks and sounds very different. Now, so who was Philip Melanchthon? Philip is his first name, P-H-I-L-I-P, -I -I and it's Philip. So who was Philip Melanchthon? Yeah, Titus? Luther's helper who wrote down a lot of his things for him. All right, so Melanchthon was from a little further south in Germany, and he was became Luther's helper. He was never a monk, and Melanchthon was never a priest. He was never ordained to be a pastor. He was just a very smart guy who learned Greek and was a kind of an expert in Aristotle. And he was also an expert in teaching rhetoric and how to teach and how to speak and how to be persuasive, even how to preach, even though he wasn't a pastor. He was a little bit younger than Luther, but he was very smart with Greek and with Latin. He was educated at the University of Tübingen in the southern part of Germany. And then he moved up to the University of Wittenberg because he had a job offer to teach at this new university that Frederick the Wise had opened. So he ended up teaching with Luther kind of by accident. Luther didn't seek him out or anything. And But Melanchthon thought, well, Luther's teaching is right. And he became a very quick supporter of Luther and became, in a sense, Martin Luther's right-hand man. And so Melanchthon was very smart very good at writing things. So that's why he wrote the Augsburg Confession. That's why he went to, Aug to Augsburg, and that's why he wrote the Apology. He was a very good writer and very smart, very good thinker. Yeah, Titus. I'm I sorry, Oliver. Um, so was he good at rhetoric? Yes, he was very good at rhetoric. He, In fact, he wrote a book on rhetoric, which was so good and so famous that everybody in German Germany used it for almost 100 years, even the Roman Catholics used it. And so, and he was, in fact, the nickname from Philip Melanchthon was the 
Prekeptor Germani, which means the teacher of Germany. So he was very respected and very loved, even by non-Lutherans. They all had to admit Philip Melanchthon was pretty smart, pretty good teacher. Okay. So one more fill in the blank, because we can do this already. It was written in both Latin and German. And why is that? Because so 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 everyone could read it. So everybody could have access. So they wrote it in Latin to start with because that was the official language. And that was the one that the Roman Catholics would be able to read and everybody would know because that was the official academy language. But then they wrote it in German so that the people who didn't know Latin could also have access to it. Okay? Mm -hmm. All right. Good. We'll stop here today. For next time, we're getting close now to start looking at some of the actual details. For next time, I want you to actually read through the first article in the Augsburg Confession. And it's pretty short. So why don't you read the first two and three. So read articles one, two, and three. It won't take you long, Jude. You've already done it once. But read articles one, two, and three. And I want you to read them in both Latin and German and see if you notice anything really very different. Okay? So articles one, two, and three in Latin and German.